Kalen, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing good, Eric. Man, thank you for having me on board. This is going to be a good time. Well, you know, Phil uh, nominated you, and you know there's a rule that once you're nominated, you cannot turn it down. It's a, a rule that I'm, I made up. I'm good, man. I, I enjoy doing these things. Um, I enjoy talking to I enjoy talking to to intelligent people that have good information. And I've watched you for a long time, and I've learned a lot from you as well. And uh, I'm I'm excited to to have a conversation with you. I think it's going to be fun. So. Uh, the only conversations you and I have had up to this point is uh, through Instagram. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Either you'll yep. post something that I agree with 100% and I'll just say, man, I, I agree or kudos to that or way to go, buddy, mm -hmm. or whatever, and vice versa. Uh, yep. And, you know, that's about the only interaction we've had. Uh, mm -hmm. I, You and I have never met. Obviously, I've met Phil before, but uh, I like what you guys are doing, man. I really like it. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's one of those things that we looked at and we said, how can we change, how can we change how things have been done in the past with regard in the, you know, into the training industry. And, um, I had a chance to, I had a, a cool chance to see everything from a really high level view when I worked at Magpul. Uh -huh. And, um, that was basically like what my springboard was to, to get into the, the industry. And I was able to see things from a, a, a high view and, <clears throat> and then identify some, some deficiencies and some things that we learned when I was working at Magpul because we had a, a very unique situation at Magpul with, um, with Magpul Dynamics. We had a company that, <clears throat> that was formulated on the image of two individuals. And once those two individuals were no longer a part of that entity, the entity was essentially dead because that was what their their names were associated with that and so when we created the modern day sniper brand we wanted to make sure that it was a brand that could that could live that could live beyond you know who formulated it and take a different approach in the training space uh from the standpoint of like hey we're going to really just specifically focus on the skills that you need to advance your abilities as a shooter and that's not always super high speed stuff, right? That's not a lot of times, you know, we talk about what's the difference between basic and advanced skills. And we really don't think there is a whole lot of difference between the, between those two, um, those two descriptive terms. And that's really how we focus our training. And it's uh, everybody does the same stuff. And some people that are faster or more capable of processing more information in a short amount of time, then that's the delineation of a basic versus an advanced shooter in our world. So um, we just want to put out really good information and we want to create well-rounded shooters. That's, that's all we're all about. Well-rounded is key. Agreed. There's a, as you know, I'm an F-class shooter. Mm -hmm. That is a very specialized type of shooting. Yes. And uh, it laying prone with the with the front rest, you know, I mean, we let the equipment do as much of the work as possible, right? Right. And we we the input from the shooter is wind reading and hand loading, like making it, yep. that rifle as just as accurate, precise as possible, because we're shooting for score, right? Like a mm -hmm. venture shooter would only, sh well, they shoot for group and for score, but. If the group is tiny, and even if it's off on the corner, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter. For us, it's both. We need accuracy and precision. <clears throat> but that's the extent of what we do. It's pretty impressive by most people's standards because we shoot small groups, right? Yep. But away from that, like, I don't know. Uh, and that's why I started shooting PRS. I wanted I wanted it. I needed more. I needed to be more well-rounded. I wanted mm -hmm. to be because... Once you make me shoot off, of, even a bipod, I wasn't that good, you know, right? because it's not as stable as what I was used to. Uh, positional, all that other stuff, right? And that, to me, it's better to be a half MOA shooter or even uh, Chris Way, you know, even a one MOA shooter from kneeling, mm -hmm. standing, prone, and sitting than being a quarter MOA shooter just from prone. You know what I right. mean? Right. More the modern rifle that we have nowadays, <clears throat> I always love hearing the saying when people are like, Oh, my rifle shoots a quarter as long as I do my part. 
it's like, nah, dude, your rifle's going to shoot a quarter, <clears throat> whether you're doing your part or not, you know, <laughs> the, the bullets are going to come out of the barrel in that quarter MOA dispersion, regardless of where you point it. So <laughs> like if you point it at point A, it's going to shoot a quarter at point A versus a corner uh, point B and so on and so forth. What we're trying to make shooters do is understand, um, how they interact with with that system and you brought up a great point because you know we used to i started shooting i started shooting this stuff in i think i shot my first rifle match in 2000 or no 1999 and it was a law enforcement sniper match down in san diego and i got i had it was a huge a super huge eye-opening experience because i was being asked to do things with a rifle that in a, in a, in a tactical capacity that I hadn't been exposed to before. And it was like, Whoa, okay. They're like, this is, this is another side of this, um, of this discipline that I haven't been, that I haven't seen yet. Mm -hmm. And that really shifted my focus on how training should be conducted. But in the military at that point in time, those wheels turn really, really slow. That's a giant, giant boat to turn. And it takes a lot of help from tugboats to get that boat turned. <laughs> And so at that point in time, we were just shooting from the prone and we would, you know, we knew that the bench rest shooting community existed and we, and, but we weren't really, it was more of like our own, um, I, I'm going to use the term shadow projection. And it's usually like, we can summarize that up into, into like tra talking trash or gossip basically. And it's just like, ah, those bench rest dudes, they don't know what they're doing. And, you know, they got those big 25, 30 pound rifles and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, look back now. <laughs> that's what we're shooting is 25 or 30 pound guns, six millimeters. And, you know, we used to turn our noses at those people. But the fact is, is that it's, it's hilarious is that now in, in 2020, everybody's trying to reinvent the wheel with all these little six millimeters that those guys, they've already done that work 30, 40 years ago, but you wouldn't know it at the, because we didn't have the internet, right? You wouldn't know it. You'd have to be involved in that, in that community you would have to have those conversations at the firing line in order to learn about the nuances of a six millimeter BR versus a BRA and the different aspects of, Hey, you want to pay attention to this when you, when you load that cartridge or whatever. And now that stuff just everywhere and it's hard to sift through, uh, and, you know, guys like yourself that are putting out really solid information. That's easy to follow. Um, there's, there's a lot of that out there and it's just really hard to sift through. Uh, but back then, if it wasn't in a magazine or you weren't getting it from somebody um, in that particular discipline, you're learning on your own, you know, just through trial and error. Well, it is, you mentioned how, you know, tactical guys would turn their nose up at benches guys mm -hmm. and it, and it, it, it's both ways, which For is, sure. which is why, like I said, I started shooting PRS because I started, I, I, I know some friends that are PRS shooters and, you know, started talking to them. And I always tell people, I'm a shooter. It doesn't matter yep. what it is, right? Exactly. And that's what I that's what I am. I enjoy shooting all types of stuff. And I figured, you know, I'm going to go try some PRS. But there's a lot to learn from both disciplines, right? You can't say mm -hmm. that one is superior than the other because it, it is a specialized, they're both specialized uh, sports, right? For sure. And uh, I've learned a lot from PRS shooters. That, that I apply to F class. Like I used to never ever because you, we shoot at known distance targets and I had a mm -hmm. thousand yard zero and that's it. I'd write it down. Okay. It's 26 MOA or 24 or whatever cartridge I was shooting. And that's it. That's all I needed to know. 24. Mm -hmm. And like sometimes in long range, we shoot 800, 900, a thousand. This is how we do, you know, ballistic calculations. Oh, we just come off for 800, it's, come off seven minutes from your thousand yard zero. And for 900, go up four minutes. That's it. Right. Because all yeah. we're looking to do is hit the target. That's it. And then once we hit it, they mark it and then we just move. Right. Mm -hmm. But because we only have two siders, when I started shooting PRS, I thought, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to use density altitude and I'm going to use a, a ballistic solver and I'm going to try to get in the center from the first shot as close as I can uh, because we would always, and sometimes we lose a shot or two, a point or two, just hanging low or hanging high. Mm -hmm. And that was because density altitude. We really, 
F class students don't really understand that because yeah. you don't have to. It is what it is, right? So I roll up that day. I start with whatever dope I had from the last time, and we're going to make those changes with my sight arounds based upon what what the bullet's yeah. telling me, right? <laughs> and like like that twenty six MOA zero that I told you about, that was my thousand yard zero always, not. In, mm -hmm. in a certain DA, it was always, it didn't matter where I was. I, it didn't matter if I was in Houston, if I was in Phoenix, if I was in freaking England, it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. It was 26. That was what we started with. Exactly. And now it's different. Now I, I, you know, I use a ballistic solver. I, I chewed up my data, which is very easy since we always shoot at known distance. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's, uh, I just, you know, it's like, Oh, today I need 25 and a half. Or today mm -hmm. I need 26 and a quarter, right? And because we're shooting, I mean, our target is one MOA. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take much <clears throat> at a thousand yards to get outside of that. And now you're, nope. now you're dropping points. So yeah. I've learned a lot from PRS. And I think PRS shooters can stand to learn a lot from from F-class or Ventress. But the problem is they kind of turn their nose up at each other. Instead mm -hmm. of saying... Hey, buddy, let's let's see what you're doing over there and see what I can learn. And I think it's if, a, a if, rifle's a rifle's a rifle. And I think if we all did that, we would advance much faster. I agree with that. I, I, I absolutely agree with that. And, you know, it comes, I think, just straight up just with maturity. You know, as as we grow and we learn, we mature and we start looking at things with a different lens and we go, oh, okay, well, yeah, I was kind of, I was kind of pigheaded when I looked at it from that point of view. No, I can learn something. Um, I, when I moved here to Washington state, <clears throat> uh, I really, I kind of, I got out of the shooting sports a little bit for, you know, for a couple, three years. Um, when I got out of the Marines, I got out of the Marines and I didn't really want to. Mm -hmm. And so that was a pretty, that was a difficult transition. <clears throat> and so looking at rifles was a little bit on the painful side at that point in time in life. <clears throat> so I went to, uh, I shot archery for a little bit and I got into the competitive archery world and, and I shot indoor, I shot indoor three spot Vegas league. And then, um, I shot, uh, outdoor 3d and it's the exact same thing. We're just shooting a bow. It's literally the same thing, meaning like the PRS world versus the archery world, both indoor and outdoor. It's still a competitive shooting sport and we're just utilizing a different platform to do it on. And so when I got, th then I said, okay, well, I met some people in the archery world um, that were also silhouette shooters here and uh, in the Pacific Northwest. Mm. And I started to chat with this guy and, and he knew, he knew some stuff about rifles and I started to listen to him and he was a wildcat shooter uh, from the silhouette world. Mm -hmm. And so he was like, he was talking about uh, 264 caliber all the time. And at that point in time, all I really knew about, um, uh, you know, the six, five had just started to, to come into the mix. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the guys up here in the Northwest, when I started to get into the precision scene, a lot of people were shooting 260. And that was something that was like, oh, okay, that's new. I need to learn about this. Well, why is everybody utilizing that cartridge? And it was quickly obvious why people were doing it, but it was just such a, it, I did, I wasn't exposed to it until I got there. And this guy was, you know, his name's John Cameron. And he's a really good friend of mine now. And we talk about all kinds of stuff. And like he was talking about, uh, are you familiar with like the 260 Bobcat? I'm not. No, it's just, it's a, it's a wildcat cartridge that he was talking about. It's a, is it wildcat or is it improved? Uh, Ooh, that's a good question. Um, so I wildcat, think uh, this is ahead, interesting. Please. A lot of people don't know the difference between wildcat and improved. So a wildcat cartridge, you need to form the brass to fit the chamber. Mm-hmm. Okay. An improved cartridge, it's literally like a 243 actually improved where you actually can feed the parent case and once you fire it, it becomes improved. So Wildcat, right. you actually have to modify the brass. Got it. Okay. So I'd have to I'd have to clarify that with him on mm -hmm. that, whether or not there's like a you know a, a parent case that you can it's probably just a two sixty. That's well, that's what he said. It was a two sixty that was that was basically the, the parent case was shortened. Because they want it is low a wildcat. Okay, all right. So if you, the, yeah, pretty sounds like you can't just feed a 260 into you it. You just can't feed a 260 yeah. into it. So, and I may be wrong. For listeners out there that have heard about the 260, well, I'm just using this as an example of, of mm -hmm. some things that I learned from this individual. Right. And he's like, hey, you know, we want low recoil, 
but we still need mass of the projectile to knock Rams over at 500 yards. I was like, Oh, okay. Well, he's like, yeah, I don't want to shoot a 308 because a 308 pulls me off the target too, too much. And I can't really see what happened. And then that was my introduction to recoil management. And it was like, Oh, okay. So other people in other disciplines are trying to do the same thing. We're just not, we're just doing this, right. We're, well, We're talking on two different wavelengths. The 708, the silhouette shooters is actually what keeps the 708 alive, I think, to this day, you know, just that, because he of talked the, a lot about that, too. Uh, but very interesting mm -hmm. how this it, it has to do with your needs, right? Yep. Yeah, I mean, I have several rifles that are just like, OK, what am I doing today? What 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 am I what am I trying to accomplish today? You know, like an 800 yard, an 800 yard and in course of fire, I might, I'm going to probably choose a six BR or a six, my, my six BRA for that. Mm -hmm. And if it's, you know, if it's at all windy and if it's a field match, I'm going to go immediately to a six Creedmoor or a six five shooting like 135 A tips. Um, because I know that I don't really have to worry too much about recoil management at that point. I'm more concerned about performance in the wind and really accurate first round impacts. So, so you so have to be able to go ahead. F class is, is kind of becoming a little bit like golf. Uh, I've, I always just bring one rifle and that's it. I shoot the same rifle for everything, but it's starting to literally become like golf. So uh, what happens is they'll bring a light recalling rifle that just shoots lights out. So if the wind is mild, they mm -hmm. pull that out because it shoots really good and it and they can shoot it fast, right? Because there's Got it. there's not a whole lot of recoil, so they can mm -hmm. shoot it fast. If the wind gets up, they put that away. They put that rifle away, and they'll pull out like a 300 short magnum or something, shooting 215 grain burgers, right? That's an in so you guys the, a lot of F class shooters are into that 300 WSM. They're getting there because uh, it's it it does offer a big advantage. However. The downside is not everybody can shoot them. I've tried one, and I just couldn't shoot it. Could it okay, let me emphasize on couldn't shoot. Uh, the recoil, it's not that it hurt me. It's that it upset the setup too much. Like, you know, right. we, we have the, the front rest and the bag and everything. And mm -hmm. all that torque and all that recoil, every time I shot it, I had to just adjust. Upsets, everything. Just set everything back up again, make sure it was perfect. And that's what I mean about you can't shoot it fast. Right. And that's why they have a lighter recoiling rifle that they, that it doesn't upset the setup. They shoot, push it back, load another one, shoot it again. Uh, which is a reason that a lot of the ventures guys shoot the six millimeter. If you've seen them shoot it, they just, yeah. they just shoot Cast. it, push it back. There's very little recoil, what? but would they, you say would you say that seven psalm has a pretty pretty significant place in f class or is that just an assumption it the psalm is has done very well i think the problem with the psalm so again it's a balance game mm -hmm. and in there's no free lunch so the psalm has better <laughs> ballistics yeah barrel life suffers right and you know some guys are pulling off their song barrels at 700 rounds yeah and for the world championship we had to ship 700 rounds which means you can't shoot the same rifle all the way through got it you know what i mean got it got it so you have to bring two barrels yeah that's yeah, nobody wants to deal with that that's, well but we do um, you do but it's not that it's not an ideal situation so for me that's my point i'd rather just bring one and then just shoot the whole thing all the way through mm -hmm. but that so that's the downside to the psalm obviously the ballistics are better mm -hmm. uh it's uh it cuts through the wind better but it also recalls more mm -hmm. so you know you're gonna burn up a couple hundred rounds in load development yeah season and, in the barrel getting it all dialed yeah and just getting make you know making sure it, it's really a good one and then you take it to let's say nationals you're going to shoot 200 rounds, 250. So now you're at 450 to 500. That's it. Like, yep. <laughs> you know, yeah. you might be able to squeeze another big match, but that's it. Whereas a 284 or 284 Shehane, you can get 1,600 to 2,000 rounds. Right. You know? So, but but ballistics are less. 
you know, you give enough 200 feet per second to a, to a psalm. To a, to a seven millimeter too, that has, you know, those bullets. Or are... the, the, the 284 is also two, a seven millimeter. So the oh, bullet, that's right. the bullet is the same. It's just about 200 feet per second. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And that Shaheen, I, so you shoot, you shoot the, what, what cartridge is it that you primarily shoot? Shaheen, which the is Shaheen. a 284 improved. So the Shaheen splits the difference between the Psalm and the 284. Okay. So the Psalm is going to be about a hundred feet per second. It's faster than, than the, uh, than the, uh, Shaheen and the Shaheen is about a hundred feet per second faster than the 284. Okay. Yeah, obviously, it depends how you load it, but about it, it about splits it right in the middle. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that that I really had um, the desire to talk to you about when when I when we figured out that we were going to do this was I, I really want to talk to you about your thoughts on um, on some load development stuff and like the differences between how we can find um, you know the process of coming up with the final load, because I think a lot of that stuff is, is starting to become lost in translation nowadays with the flood of information on the internet. And everybody's just like, Oh yeah, just shoot this and load them at this. And, and you, you lose the, you lose the understanding of what actually are you trying to accomplish in the load development process? Consistency. It, it, that's all we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. So, I split it up in, when I teach classes. I I split it up into three different categories. So you have combustion, mm -hmm. you have harmonics, mm -hmm. and then you have external ballistics, right? Because those play into everything. You know, at some point the bullet's going to be in flight to the target, so yep. that also has to be dealt with. Uh, combustion is anything that affects combustion. That is your case size, your powder type, your primer, your neck tension, your bullet, all that, right? But that is pretty well figured out. Mm -hmm. So all you have to do is copy what somebody else is doing, right? Like, oh, 6BR, 6BRA, 6 uh, Creed, any of that, doesn't matter. You kind of mm -hmm. know what's what you can buy, right? So from experience, I just tell people, go buy Lapua Brass Burger Bullets, It'll shoot, right? But mm -hmm. obviously, there's a lot of other combinations that, that do well. It's just what I know. So I, that's where I start. So pick a primer, a good primer. <coughs> and nowadays, it's easier said than done, but whatever. Pick a primer. Uh, and anything, neck tension. Pretty simple. Load a bullet, measure your OD, and get a bushing. That's about, uh, now I suggest that you get about a three to four thousandths under the loaded round. And then you're going to size it, size your breast down, and then just follow it up with an expander mandrel that's two thousandths under bullet diameter. So for a 243, you know, a six millimeter, you, you know, which is a 243, you would use a 241 mandrel, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's pretty simple stuff. And pick a powder that everybody else is using. Like if you're using mm -hmm. a six BR, Varget. N150, H4895, any of those, right? Everybody kind of knows what to use. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I have a a uh, video on how to, I, I go to jam and come off of that. Jam is just the point where you don't want to be. That's yep. where you're going to have problems. And you can come off of that. Uh, but if you're limited by mag length, then obviously shorter than mag length. And that's your seating depth, your initial seating depth. Yep. Uh, and then you just go do a, uh, a powder test. Okay. Uh, there's multiple ways. There's, there's a million ways that you can do this, but ultimately people are, you know, they go and they, they, they try to select their group size based on the powder charge, right. which I think is where the confusion happens because right now we're just simply looking for a consistent load. We don't care what the groups look like. When you say that, <clears throat> I 100% agree with you. So when you do that, so I know that you are, uh, you subscribe to um, uh, velocity testing, uh, identifying uh, Well, it's not velocity points. testing. It's Thank it's, you. Ex please expand on that. It's, uh, it's consistent combustion, right? I don't okay. even care what the speed is as long as it's consistent. 
right? It's agreed. Just, Absolutely it's just, agreed. It's no different than BC. If I asked you, hey, Kaylin, what's the best BC? You're like, the, the, just, I, I know a lot of, I know shooters look at BC and a lot of them just chase that BC, but yeah. consistent BC is better than high BC. Right? Agreed. Same thing with powder. And the only way that, because I don't have a pressure uh, gauge or any of that, right? right? The easiest way that we can measure is with a chronograph, right? So I, I do a ladder test uh, with powder. You know, I just start low and work my way up on powder. And uh, a lot of people call that the Saturday test. All it is is a ladder test. Right, mm -hmm. you just increment your powder and just look at your chronograph numbers. You can do one shot, two shots, whatever makes you feel good. But I I do one shot, okay. But that is not the final because you can't trust it with one shot. I'm agreed. You just can't. The, the 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 chronograph has errors. There's but right now we're simply looking for an idea of where we need to be. Mm -hmm. right so i do a ladder test uh initially if it's a new cartridge but let's say for for viewers do a ladder test start low work your way up un until you find pressure pressure is uh hard bolt lift flattened primers swipe on your breast any of that just don't go past that just yep. don't be brave just back it off uh but anyway, just work up until you hit pressure. And if you load it extra, that's fine. You can always pull them. Saves mm -hmm. you a trip to the range. Just load way beyond what you think you're going to need. Mark them clearly <laughs> and oh, work yeah. your way up. But anyway, run that. For me, it's just easier to graph it. And I don't care if it's flat. It doesn't have to be flat. A lot of people look for a flat spot. Typically, yeah. it's what I tell people, look for a flat spot. But it doesn't have to be flat. At some point, you'll see that, let's say you're doing a 6BR. Mm -hmm. uh, we're probably going to go in three-tenth increments or two-tenths. Yep. Uh, probably three-tenths. At some point, the speed is going to start climbing less per charge. So let's just say uh, from 29 to 29.3, uh, it increased 40 feet per second. And from 29.3 to 29.6, it increased another 50 feet per second. And then at 29.9, it went up 20 feet per second. And mm -hmm. then the next step, it only went up 10 feet per second. And then the next step, it only went up 7 feet per second, right? And then the next step, it went up 8 feet per second. And then the next step, it goes 60 feet per second, right? Got it. You're Th like, ah, here is kind of where things are becoming happy. It doesn't have Got to it. be flat. It's just it, you can see how the load is, is – it just – you're just getting a cleaner, more efficient burn rate, right? Mm -hmm. And and again, people think, oh, well, you're only looking at one shot. No, I'm not looking at one shot. I'm looking at the correlation between that shot and the previous and the previous, right? I'm looking at the big mm -hmm. picture. Yep, yep. For me, it's a lot easier to graph it. Um, you graph it, and then you're just going to go to the middle of wherever it looked pretty good. Mm-hmm. Let's just say from 29.6 to 30.2, it looked like they're not increasing much. Go to go to the middle, uh, 29.8, right? Yeah. And now we're going to go. So that's the combustion part. Okay. And now we're going to go handle the harmonics. What if your groups don't look there very good? You've heard this before. Don't I have great not. ES, but the groups are big. That's fine. That's because you have yeah. only one side of the equation handled. Let's go right. worry about the other one. Well, now you do seating depth test. Or if you have a tuner, that's where you do your tuner test. And that's going to be your harmonics, right? Because mm -hmm. your combustion is handled, but as it's going down the barrel, it's creating harmonics that they're just not happy. If your groups are not small, your, your harmonics are are not happy so one way is seating depth you just start pushing your bullet down three thousands at a time mm -hmm. shoot groups and you're gonna see you're gonna see your groups come in and out now sometimes they get bigger keep going and they get some it's a sine wave right yep you just mm -hmm. don't know where you are in a sine wave you just got to find the, the you got to figure it out and the only way you do that is by shooting right if you want to uh 
So anyway, you do your sitting depth test. You'll see where it dips. That's your window. Okay? Now, the difference between sitting depth and powder is on the sitting depth, we're going to stay on the long side of the window. So let's just say 2.2 to 2.190 is your window. Typically, mm -hmm. they're 6,000 wide. So let's just call it 2.194, right? Okay. Well, you, you're going to load towards the 2.2 because erosion only happens one Ero way. Yep. Whereas powder charge, temperature, swings, whatever, it's going to happen both ways. Mm -hmm. Throat erosion is only one way. So right. just load it to the long side of your long window. Side. What happens, though, that's why I said that the initial powder, that's, that was just initial, because once you do your seating depth, you're technically changing case capacity. Correct. Which affects what? Combustion. Pressure. Yep. Pressure, which is in our combustion basket, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the column. So now we go back. And now we're going to go, I think we had said 29.8 was our 29 charge. 29.8. Yep. Right? So now you're going to go 29.5, 29.2, and then you're going to go the other way. Six See if it still shoots. Right. You can go in one tenth increments. You can go in two tenth increments. You can go in three tenths increments. Whatever. Right. But now you're going to shoot them. Now you're going to do either three or five shot groups over a chronograph at at a target. Mm -hmm. And then none of this. I pull this. If you're not feeling, you lay down behind that rifle and you dry fire if you have to. Just get really comfortable. And then you're going to give me. Again, this is this is where it depends. How much, how many components do you have? How much time do you have? Yeah. How much? The point is, you're gonna shoot your groups, and now we're really gonna know, because now we're we're, you know, we kind of zeroed in on the, on the idea or or the load. Well, now we're really gonna cover, but now we're actually gonna do five shot groups, and then you shoot those groups, and you're gonna see where, same thing. Your extreme threat's going to get low, and your groups are going to be small, and you're going to see the window. You're going to see where they come in and out. That's why mm -hmm. one-tenth is better, but I understand with components. I want to do two-tenths or three-tenths even. Got it. And all you're trying to do is get in the middle of that window, just so you can make it as consistent as possible. Mm -hmm. Same thing with seating depth. If you only have one group that's small, that is not a window. That's that is not a not consistent, a stable load. Keep you going. Keep going. Until you find a window where where things are happy, right? Yeah, we, we subscribe to the same to pretty much the same uh, process. I, I use uh, the optimal charge weight development process for my charge weight for the combustion or the pressure aspect of things. Yeah, but that one takes group size into account, doesn't it? Nope. It nope. just takes uh, it takes plot. It takes where it it takes where um where the center of the groups fall in relationship to the point of aim to find the consistency that you're that you're speaking about which would be the flat spot and the velocity right but it's, but but once what happens once you change your seating dip and you do it all over again so changes. if you truly well based upon my experience truly if you if you're able to find the center point of that let's just say i fire um you know in three tenth increments I'm going up, um, let's just, for for ease of numbers, I just did this with a seven psalm. So mm -hmm. like um, 59, seven, 60.0, 60.3. All three of those charges land in the same point of impact on the target, right? Okay. Within a tenth of Yeah, an like if you were to layer those targets, they'd, they'd make one. Yep, one they'd group. all make yeah. one group, right? right. So, so now I'm going to look at 60.0 and I'm going to say, okay, that's the charge that's going to keep my pressure stabilized mm -hmm. from if I have to dip down into that 59.7 or if I have to dip up into that 60.3, that's going to keep my, my, I'm not going to see a point of impact shift. So then I go into my velocity testing and if you go into your velocity, or not your velocity testing, I'm sorry, your seat depth testing, mm -hmm. it seems to have worked. I, um, I had one rifle that was giving me fits. Uh, the the first chart, the first, the first load development that's really given me fits in a long time. Um, it was a seven LRM, 
And I, I mean, I just could not get that thing to shoot. So, and I, I'm, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the cartridge. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with, with, with that. It was just this particular barrel bullet cartridge combination. I started to go through components and I was like, I'm not even doing this. I'm not, I'm not going to continue to No, we're just going to pull that barrel and we're going to go do something different. So every time I've used that method, it produces good results for me that are consistent across pretty much the life of the barrel. Well, if it works for you, then that's really all that matters, mm -hmm. right? Believe exactly. The, believe the target. Believe the target. Exactly. Believe so, the results. So, um, again, if you, if you have a tuner, you can mm -hmm. skip the, the seating dip. That's yeah. So, which makes I it a lot easier because you're not you're not changing your case capacity, right? When you're seating exactly, the bolt. exactly. I'm just changing. I'm changing the interface. I'm changing the the vibrational pattern of the barrel and how the bullet interacts with it. Correct. But now that's two columns. Right? Remember we, I said there was three? Mm -hmm. There's yep. the combustion, harmonics, and then external ballistics. The external and this aspect. is the one where a lot of people kind of get hung up on. Uh, so they have a rifle that shoots, uh, let's just say quarter MOA mm -hmm. at 100 yards. And mm -hmm. their extreme spread is single digit. Mm-hmm. But they did all the load development at 100 yards. Mm -hmm. And then they go, man, I'm going to go shoot 1,000 yards. Mm -hmm. And they go shoot 1,000 yards. And this gun is shooting, I don't know, two MOA. Uh -huh. Or even one MOA, one and a half MOA. And what right. do they say? Well, that's why you're supposed to do your load development at the distance at which you're supposed to shoot. Uh, which, you know, I, I agree there's merits to that. However, they go, well, you can't tune at 100 because it's not going to hold up. Mm -hmm. Well, wait a minute. So anyway, so they end up, the, the, it doesn't shoot at 1,000. What would right. you do to fix it? Based uh, on the scenario that I just gave you. All right, let's recap. So we're talking, it's a quarter of my gun, 10 shots. Quarter of my gun, 10, 10 shots. 10 shots at 100 yards. Extreme spread, single digits. It shoots one and a half MOA at 1,000 yards. Mm. One and a half MOA at 1,000. Well, there's, I mean, there's many, there's many, are, are we, are we, there's only one thing. <laughs> well, it's basically, it's, it's how fast the, it's the consistency of how fast the bullet's going and the ballistic coefficient of that projectile. The bullet's going single digit. Okay. So, so single digit, single digits yeah, on the quarter SDs. MOA, quarter MOA, single digit ES, the SD is like two. Right. So from my perspective, if that was happening, that's telling me that at a thousand yards, I'm having some inconsistencies somewhere with the physical properties of the projectile itself. Exactly. External ballistics. At that point, it's the bullet, mm -hmm. right? The rifle did all it could. You can't ask more from that rifle. Exactly. The, yep, the rifle put, you. the rifle put those bullets in the air. Mm -hmm. through the in same the most hole, consistent way. In the most consistent way you could. Right, it 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 delivered those bullets. It put them airborne at relatively the same speed mm -hmm. through the same path. Because a hundred yards only tells us when they're shooting small at a hundred yards tells us that they're already going down the exact same path, all of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the next the next nine hundred yards, if they deviate from that, the rifle can't do anything else exactly the rifle is what it is at that the point. rifle did all it could mm -hmm. that means now you got to look at your bullets now you have inconsistent bc that's it mm -hmm. right yeah so that's why i like to separate those into three different columns that's a great way of doing it that's that's a good way of looking because at it's it, very easy sure. to troubleshoot mm -hmm. and uh and that's why i like to you know that that uh that ocw that's great but again, once you change your seating depth, you need to go back and verify it. Mm -hmm. So technically, if you think about it, that's what I'm doing, except for I don't waste the components on the first go around. You, you do the components on the back end. Right. So because yep. now I'm, I'm on my final seating depth. Correct. Got it. So now my fight, you're, you're in your process, your final seating depth, <clears throat> pardon me, you're using, then you're going to say, okay, is my load pressure resilient? after I find that seating depth. If you think about it, again, it's a balance. Every time you mm -hmm. move one, you have to you move, gotta the, move other, the other. You got to move the other. Right? Yep. And because seating depth <clears throat> changes the size of the case, essentially, right? 
then you have to go and handle the pressure side, which right. is combustion, right? Which is the powder. So you, you adjust the powder, you change the seating depth. You change yep. the seating depth, well, now you got to adjust the powder, right? <coughs> so what comes first, right? The egg or the chicken? Well, first you have to come up with a with a seating depth that works for you. That's why I said go to jam and come off with that just so that we're safe and you're as long as you can with a maximum case capacity. Mm -hmm. Or if you're limited by mag length, same thing. Go to mag length, come off of that, right? We just mm -hmm. have to find a starting place. Mm -hmm. Now we got to go handle the powder. And that's why I just kind of do an initial ladder test right. just to kind of somewhat zero in on where I'm going to be. Mm -hmm. Then I got to go back and do my seating depth. <laughs> right and once the seating depth's done then you have to go and adjust <clears throat> your powder charge again to make sure it's it's uh, happy with a new case capacity right yeah i see what and you're then saying, you're yeah. done now if you again if you have a tuner then you you just select a seating depth and and like <laughs> like my uh my and for that i like my 6br is mm -hmm. 1812 1.812 my uh uh my 647 no it's vice versa my 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 647 is 1812 i believe my 6br is 1776 so i i, I just pick numbers that i can remember easily there you go cuz they and then you just tune to them and then i just use a tuner right yeah okay uh but that's just the easy way that i found and it just flat out works Right. I, I use it in my F class guns. I use it and it's now you have a uh uh six BR, right? This uh, is yeah, just BRA. This is B R A. Uh, mm -hmm. this is just the initial. Once you have one, the next one, if you have a tuner you can just tune that to you the You can it, you can use the load from your previous barrel, leftover ammo. Because mm -hmm. you need a hundred rounds or so anyway before just, you can yep. start doing load development. I usually take ammo from the previous barrel, shoot in the new one, and all I do mm -hmm. is adjust the tuner. Now, if you don't have a tuner, if it doesn't shoot, adjust seating depth. And then shoot it, practice, do whatever you need to do with it. Just have fun. And then you can just do a seating depth test with the load that you have from your previous the, barrel. The and, then go straight in, and then go straight into your... Uh, your uh, final powder. You don't have to do the initial ladder test, right? Because you already know more or less where you're going to be. You're not going to mm -hmm. be more than six or eight tenths off. Yeah, it's not going to be much at all. So that's this. You do just the final, right? Yeah. And and you're going to be extremely close, and um, it just speeds up everything, and and it just gives you that confidence that that you need to. Uh, the main thing when I teach is. They see the light and they go. It's it's a it's a yeah it's a pathway right and they go it's a roadmap and they go mm -hmm. oh oh shit if you put them in and they'll ask me hey well I got a different lot of powder what do I need to do okay I'm like well which which basket is it in well that's a combustion okay well then powder test mm -hmm. right hey I Just got a different different lot of bullets okay do a seating depth test. Mm -hmm. Right. That's it. Right. That, that's once one is once one is established, then we can isolate it, and exactly. it's, it's all process of elimination. Yeah, and uh, that's it. And then they'll come back to me and say, "Hey, my rifle shoots great, but ES is really high." Okay, I just use powder. Right. Isn't that going to throw my groups off? More likely, but that's okay. You got to handle one first before you handle the other. Right. Exactly. But anyway, it's, it's, uh, that's how I've simplified it. No, that's, that's, that's great, man. I mean, that's, that's something that I'm going to, that I'm going to try out as well and, and, and just see what the results are. Um, I try to, I'm the same with you, man. I want to do the least amount possible for the maximum return because time is, it's time, right? Time as we, um, as we get more responsibilities in life, time becomes more and more of a priority and, I can't, I don't want to be sitting at the loading bench for hours and hours and hours trying to figure it out. Yeah. And components, right? Mm -hmm. The yeah. very first time I met Phil, uh, I actually told him about, you've seen that video. Don't chase, stop chasing the lands. Yeah. I literally had that <laughs> conversation it. with him. That was before stop chasing the lands became 
what it is. Uh, I told him, I said, okay, right. So, so let's say you have a, cause what we just simply discussed is keeping the rifle, you know, tuning the rifle. Mm-hmm. Well, now we got to keep it in tune. Right. Right. And, uh, and he told me, we had this conversation, but I told him, I said, well, it's real simple. Because if you have a rifle that shoots, right, low ES, good groups, and all of a sudden it stops shooting. Well. What happened? But the ES is still good. Well, then it's harmonics, right? Mm-hmm. You got to do a seating depth test. Except right. now there's only one way that, you, that, it, that it can go. Right. It's- you just seat it longer. Yeah, and mm-hmm. I say you just do three thousands longer, six thousands, nine thousands, and it'll shoot, right? It'll come right back. And if it happens, if it happens to shoot, but it now all your your all, all of a sudden your seating that or your extreme spread is high. Yeah. Now I got to go back to powder. And what do you do? Which way do you go? Which way? Me, do you okay. go? Well, if so, okay. So if I if. Um, um, the rifle stops shooting and I go change, I go adjust my seating depth and I get it shooting back. Mm-hmm. I get the, I get it shooting back well right? Um, with the new seating depth, but then my ES is go to hell in a hand basket. Right. <clears throat> I'm going to have to go back and I'm going to have to go back and identify um, what's going on with the combustion aspect of things. I know, but so same thing, right? You go up because by yeah, seating because the bullet farther more, out, I have more you case have more capacity. case capacity. I'll just so go back add, and, and test incrementally. Mm-hmm. Then you bring it back in, right? right. But uh, again, this is all under the assumption, and this is where barrel cleaning comes into play, that your rifle is as it was when you worked up a load, which yep, means exactly. the barrel was clean. You can mm-hmm. <laughs> you can keep a barrel consistently clean. You cannot keep it consistently dirty. So That's a good point. For consistency, keep it clean. Yeah. So I've actually kind of changed, I've changed my mindset on cleaning. Um, once I started to shoot more and more of the, of the small calibers, Mm -hmm. 30 cals, 30 cals. I mean, you can just shoot the hell out of those things. And if my experience is they don't really, they don't really care too much. Well, they care. They just, they just, your, your requirements don't show it. Correct. Yeah. That's a great way of putting that. Yeah, you just don't. It's lost in the noise at that point in time. Three hundred eight care. We need a freaking shirt that says three hundred eight care. <laughs> three hundred eight care. <laughs> <laughs> so, this was a realization that I had when I was talking to Bart Souter from Bart's Bullets. He he just won the three gun aggregate at the Nationals Venture Shooter. Uh, three different guns. Five days of shooting. One hundred and fifty shots. Each uh, rifle. Uh. Total. Total. Uh, okay. 30, what was it? 50 shots. It's 10 groups per rifle. Okay. 10 groups with each rifle. Uh, five shots each. So it's 50, 50, 50. So 150 shots between mm-hmm. 100 and 200 yards. Okay. Uh, his aggregate for three rifles, 30, 30 groups was uh 250 half quarter inch okay second place the aggregate was okay so let's let's put in numbers so his aggregate was uh, the best he could remember is 0. 0.20 0. 0.250 0.250 okay second place was 0. 0.2501 <laughs> okay yeah so yep. he's telling me that his rifle, when he wasn't cleaning it very well, he said it wasn't shooting. I said, define that. Yeah, yeah, okay. He said, well, it was shooting 180s instead of 150s. Are you there? Okay. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Hang on, my camera just shit itself. Hang on. Oh, look, look it, if, it's never heard of this kind of group sizes. <laughs> 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 all right here we go we're coming back to the regular camera that it just tapped out it says it was too hot so we'll turn it back on oh so minute. he said my rifle was shooting two uh, 180s when it really should have been shooting 150s okay 
180 grain, 180 grain bullets instead, and he should have no, been no, shooting no, harder. No, 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 no. 180,000 groups. Oh, oh 0. okay. 0. 0.18. Okay. Versus Got it. 0. 0.15. Now, when was the last time you shot a 0. 0.18 group and you thought, man, my gun is just really not shooting well? Yeah. Well, uh, that would have to do with the baseline of the rifle. Like, that's what my is that point, rifle? right? And what's, that's what's my point. When you say, well, my 3 doesn't really care. It, it cares. It's just that your requirements are such that it's not noticeable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when he told me that, it really opened my eyes to how we see things, right? Because for them, like for <sighs> me or just about the majority of the people in this world, if you're shooting 0.180 groups, mm-hmm. they're going to be ecstatic. Yeah, that's fantastic. And and Bart's going, oh, something's wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> For sure. It really right? emphasizes what they do. Yeah, I agree on that. Absolutely. And to have one, here's, here's the kicker, right? To have one by one ten thousandth of an inch that's insane. indicates why he cares about exactly. that so much. Yeah, because that's his game. Yeah, so I think it, it's not that they don't care. It's not that the rifles don't care. It's just that our needs don't outline the problem. You're right. It's 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 lost in the noise at that point in time. Mm-hmm. No, that's great perspective, and I, I have changed. Uh, I have changed my thought process on that. And do you? And you use? I've watched. We've watched your videos. You, you subscribe to um visually seeing what's happening inside the bore when it comes to fouling and cleaning and i think that's really important because now now that we have the ability to see what's going on inside the bore with just some really simple bore cams it allows you to kind of it allows you to visually see what is what your efforts are doing to the in to the inner surfaces of the bore so that way you have some sort of baseline to go okay I did this with this particular solvent for this many strokes and this is the results that I got. So I would love to hear a little bit more of your perspective on that because I think it's, I think it's interesting and um, it makes, it makes for great conversation. Borescopes are the best thing that's come, Mm -hmm. come around in a very long time. Uh, A lot of people are afraid of borescopes. And it's it's not that they're afraid of the borescope. Is there? They they just don't know what they're looking at. Mm. I'm afraid of snakes because I don't right. know snakes. Right. Exactly. A, any snake is a killer snake yeah. in my world, in my eyes. Right. Right. So nowadays, a borescope is very cheap. You can go on Amazon, get a test long bucks. test long scope, mm-hmm. and I suggest you get. You splurge a little, maybe spend 120 or whatever they are, and get the one with the screen. Because mm-hmm. we keep one right by our bench. And having the screen, having zero prep, literally just hit the button and stick it in there and look, is, it's just going to allow you to use it more. Mm-hmm. Okay. But just, I've, you know, I have a an expensive bore scope yep. from, you know, the Hawkeye, just because that's all that we could get. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was important for me to have one. And uh, so I had one. So I had a lot of friends come over and say, hey, can you can you look in my barrel? Or, you know, mm-hmm. or they come by and bring the rifle. And first thing I do is like, let me look in there. Mm-hmm. And I said, is it clean? Oh, yeah. And I look in there and I'm like, oh, look at all this copper. Look at all this carbon. Oh, you got a carbon ring. Well, I cleaned mm-hmm. it. I'm like, you patched it. Right, exactly. There's That's a difference the, between cleaning and patching. Yeah, we're not. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. So, uh, I say, look, how if without a bore scope, the only sign that we know that it or that we know, I'm going to say that in quotations, that it's clean is that a patch is clean. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean the barrel is clean. That just means the the patch didn't get anything else out. Yeah, the patch didn't take anything out of the yeah, barrel. So, so you cleaned the easy stuff, but the stuff that really needs to get removed, it's still in there. But because it's really <laughs> stubborn and hard, it's not coming out with a patch, so you're assuming it's gone. Right, exactly. And when uh, in reality, it's not. It's not, and that's literally the stuff that you have to get out. So get a borescope, look in there, 
just when you get it, put your rifle up there, clean, dirty, doesn't matter, and just look in there and s- just look. Mm-hmm. You're not probably going to make a lot of sense of what you're looking at at first, but you will learn mm-hmm. and then clean it. And then just do your typical cleaning regimen without a bore scope. And when you're done, then look with your bore scope. Right. And see if it's really clean. Right. And and then go from there. That's huge. That that's huge. And my first, you know, foray into that world of cleaning rifles, it was, you know. To, to get the cold shot, you know, the famed cold shot mm-hmm. to hit exactly where, man, they would make, we would be made, we'd be made to clean rifles four times a day, <laughs> three, three, four times a day. You know, you'd shoot 30 shots, 40 shots from some drills and they say, all right, clean your guns. We're going to do a cold shot after chow. And it's like, okay. Cause all of your cold shots are graded and we could, we got to the point and, and we, the only way that we do this though, is through trial and error, lots of experience and, and lots of, lots of time. Like I could clean that rifle in a specific way and I could predict my cold shot to within, you know, a, a, a quarter of a minute of angle. And then I knew that it would come right back to the original zero based upon how I cleaned it. But that was a tremendous amount of effort. And it's just like, look guys, this is not practical outside of, outside of this particular environment. Mm-hmm. It's not practical. Right. So um, and that kind of drove me in a direction of cleaning where it's like, once I started to, you know, in my mind, I was like, ah, I don't really have to clean nearly as much as what, as what I was once taught. Um, and then I started to go back to the smaller cartridge or smaller calibers and cartridges. And then it was like, okay, yeah, you can't get away with this as much as you can. You know, I can take a, you know, I still have good groups out of a six, five Creedmoor after, you know, 350 shots. But I know that if I start pushing beyond that 350 shots, then it's going to start to fall apart and I have to do something to it or else it's not going to shoot well. 350 shots when the barrel's new or when the barrel's old? Um, you know, midlife. I mean, I, that's usually the way that I'm looking at it. I mean, again, I don't really I don't really dig super down deep into the weeds with that. I, I'll shoot it. Um, I'll shoot it, see the groups all right, that's good to go. I'm happy with that. And I'll go shoot a couple matches with it. Mm-hmm. Or maybe I'll go teach a class and do some demos or drills with it. I'll shoot the, I'll bring the gun home. I'll shoot it. And I'll say, let's say, Hey, I got 350 rounds through it. I'll shoot it. And it'll shoot, you know, inside a half for my purposes, for my needs. Mm-hmm. That's totally fine. I'm down with that. Right? right. Um, and then, and then I know that about that 350 round mark, I should, I need to clean it or else it will bite me. And if I start pushing into that 400. Why do you but, think, it, uh, what do you think happens after 350? There in my mind, right. I don't, mm-hmm. this is just, this is just, you know, my understanding is the, the, the surface of the bore starts to get to the point where it, there's a, it crosses a threshold and says, okay, I'm not going to. I'm not going to play anymore. Meaning the way that the bullet is interacting with the surface of the bore is no longer consistent or it's reached a critical point where uh, the, the stability of the projectile becomes affected by the surface of the bore as it travels down the barrel. Surface of the bore? Uh, well, I mean, I'm generalizing this. So it would be the lands. Right. Well, uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's goes back to my first question. It's like, is this the first 350 on a new barrel or the, or the, so I guess here's what I'm getting at from a hundred to 350. This is barrel life mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's way different than from 1500 to 15 to 1850. Agreed. Absolutely. And that's, that's my point. And you are absolutely correct on the, the surface, you know, as the bullet interacts with the surface, mm-hmm. it leaves stuff behind right Mm -hmm. build up all that stuff gets built up and yes it affects how the bullet flies Mm -hmm. right and that's the problem with 350 rounds that at some point you're not going to make it 350 you may only make it 300 and then maybe 250 right and that's where Mm -hmm. the problem is you don't know when and that's why cutting back 
you know, like we do. It's like, hey, the feedback that I have is the match that I just shot. Sure. The gun is shooting great. What should I do? Well. Yeah, there's, there's the conundrum because well, you know it's coming. Well, yeah, and typically they <laughs> say, typically this is how it goes. Actually, there's two mindsets, right? It's the, the, the PRS mindset. And I'm not picking on PRS guys. It's just what I know from the people that I've met. They go, it's shooting great. Why would I clean it? Right. Mm-hmm. Whereas when you talk to that was my That was used to be my point of view too. When, but when you talk to benches guys, go, it's shooting great. I better get back to that window where it shoots great. Got from it. zero to whatever. Let's just say 100 mm-hmm. rounds. Well, the benchers guys, they, they clean every 10 rounds, 10 or 15, right? right? Because mm-hmm. they go, it shot amazing in this window. It's like a typewriter. I'm just going to get it right back to that window, and I'm going to stay yeah, yeah. in that window always. This It is no different than changing the oil in your car. It's running great. How many people <laughs> say, it's running great? I'm not going to change the oil. Why don't you change the oil? Nobody says that. Well, maybe some people. But nobody, right. nobody. That's why it's called preventative maintenance. Exactly. So that's literally what this is. Cleaning a barrel is preventative maintenance. Um, you're trying to, everything is an aggregate. If you start thinking about it as an aggregate, it makes it a lot easier to understand and a lot easier to deal with cleaning barrels. Uh, you are handed a barrel that is capable of, let's say, half MOE aggregate for the life of the barrel. Okay. All right. And let's say that life is 2,000 rounds. It is okay. capable of half MOE aggregate, meaning some groups are going to be smaller, some are going to be bigger, but the average is going to be a quarter MOE. I mean, a half MOE mm-hmm. over 2,000 rounds. Well, if you don't do your part, you, you know, you get it, you let it get too dirty. Now you're 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 gonna start getting bigger groups. One M- one MOA group, right? One MOA, let's say three quarter MOA. Well, guess what? That's gonna hurt your average for the life of the barrel. Mm-hmm. So if you keep it clean, if you keep it consistent, it should give you that half MOA forever. So so for the PRS guys out there, right? So um, if you are uh, shooting a match. Okay. And I'm just going to use this as an example. Um, because the way that I do this, um, uh, I'm looking at this and I'm like, Hey, so I'm going to shoot this rifle match. Hang on, let me get this going here. Um, I got my rifle cleaned. I got my barrel cleaned. Okay. And then I am going to go shoot this rifle match. And I know I'm going to put about 250 rounds through it. And so, all right, keep going. We're so we're shooting, we're shooting, we're getting ready to go shoot a PRS match. I know I'm going to shoot about 250 rounds between, you know, going to check my zero and validate my trajectory at the new venue and make sure everything's good to go. Right. Um, match is going to call for 200 rounds. Mm-hmm. The finish the first day of shooting, the rifle shoots well. I'm not really concerned about anything. Me personally, I'm not cleaning it. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go shoot. I'm going to go into the next day without any, without any gremlins. I'm not letting any gremlins in, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go into that next day. I'm going to shoot it and I'm going to finish out that second day of shooting. And then when I'm done with that, I usually will come home and I will shoot the rifle just to see what the, just to see what the groups are doing Mm -hmm. and to make sure that I'm not going crazy. Right. Because I always want to kind of get some sort of baseline established then I will clean it. Um, I might burn up some match ammo, you know, and train a little bit. Um, but then I'm going to clean that. I'm going to clean the rifle after I shoot that match, because I know that I'm not going to be able to get away with another 150 rounds. Right now, if you're in that situation, are you going to clean that gun in between day one and day two of a two day event? Yes. Yes. Okay. And, and that's because, you know, through your experience that I know that everything's going to come right back to where it needs to be. And I'm going to be, I'm going to be good to go. So I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll tell you a story shooting PRS. Uh, I went and shot a uh, suppressed match, the silent night 
match. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, I'm traveling with PRS guys, and I'm like, I'm not going to take my cleaning stuff because I know they're not going to clean, and I don't want to be the guy. You know, I was I was riding with somebody else, and I'm like, I'm not going to be that guy. I, I'm just, they're doing it. I'm going to do it too. Um, so we go, and you know, we shoot Friday. We we shoot practice. I shoot a few shots, and then Saturday, well Saturday, or I guess Friday night, we shoot the first day, and I'm like in top ten after day one, and. Like, it's killing me that my barrel's dirty. Like, I'm like, man, it shot so good. Like, I, I want that tomorrow. Right. And the only way that I personally know how to guarantee that is to I clean it clean and it. start over. Mm -hmm. uh, well, of course, I didn't clean. And the next day, about halfway through, I start blowing primers. Because with that suppressor oh. yeah, and that load that I was shooting, it, that carbon just built up so much that I was start blowing primers. So guess what? From there on, I was pretty much out of the competition. I mean, I, I kept shooting. I was so mad that I just kept shooting. I right, was mad right. at myself. Uh, You're mad at yourself because you knew you knew what you had to do and you chose not to do it. Exactly. And so not only when I answered yes, absolutely, it's because I've done I've done it to where I didn't do it and it bit me real hard. So got it. Yes, absolutely. That's a fair that's a fair thing to say, man. That's a totally fair thing to say. Oh, uh, and it's different for everyone. But like I said, based on my experience, the only way to guarantee the same performance is to do the same thing. All over now, again. if you, so if you clean, you're not going to, you don't, you don't worry about re-zeroing or, or, or seeing where that first shot's going to go. You're Lockies. totally confident. Lockies. So, what's say again? Are you familiar with Lockies? Lockies? Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. All right. Educate me. So. Educate me. So you clean your barrel. Yep. And you can go to Amazon and just get Lockies. It's a it's a lock lubricant. Okay. That's why I brought a notebook. Yeah. Lockies. Yeah. Lock ease. I think just E A S E maybe. Um but after you're done cleaning your barrel, clean clean, you run two patches with Lockies. What okay, when you get that bottle, throw a bullet in there. <laughs> and before you patch it, just shake it up. It's it's a uh, it's it's a uh, it's graphite, I think it's graphite, uh, suspended in alcohol or something. Okay. And you you're gonna run two wet patches with this stuff, and you kind of just short stroke it. And what it's gonna do is gonna put graphite in whatever you know we talk about the surface of the board, right? Mm -hmm, it's gonna mm -hmm. fill all that in with 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 that graphite. All right. Okay. And then you just run two wet patches with that. That's it. Run two wet patches, take out your board guide, clean out your chamber real well to make sure there's none of the lockies in there. Just clean mm -hmm. your chamber, lube your lugs, inspect your firing pin, whatever you do, do every same time thing. you clean your Normal rifle. Thing. And your first shot's going to be with the others. Interesting. Interesting. I learned this from the benchers guys. Interesting. Well, see, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, shit, that's, that's awesome. So... And so essentially it, the first, it, it, if it's not in there, talk about being predictable. Uh, I find that in my F class rifles, my first shot's about, uh, it's about a minute low, mm -hmm. but only one. Only one. Right. And that's it. Uh, Cause you're cleaning it so consistently. You can, you, you know that it's going to happen. And yeah. And, uh, you know, for me, I don't even worry about it, but it, this goes back to by day two. That's another thing about PRS. You know what your stage is going to be. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you know that it's going to be a stage where you have, I don't know, maybe small targets or something. Yeah, yeah. Now you're like, it is imperative that I go and shoot this thing at least one time. Sure. Right? And yep. they usually have a sighting area. But mm -hmm. you just go and say, hey, I need to shoot this rifle. Correct? Uh Worst case scenario, they don't have one. Well, you're gonna aim at the, you know aim a little high, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right, and yeah. Typically, the first target's a big target, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you're doing a KYL or anything. Yeah. But the targets are pretty pretty big in PRS that it's really not an issue. But mm -hmm. your mileage will vary. Test it in your rifle, and this goes back to doing the same thing over and over and over. You'll know. 
how that barrel behaves. You will know. Mm -hmm. Literally to the point of uh, that, like you said earlier, you knew that where your first bullet would go. It wouldn't totally. go in the group, but you knew where it was going. That's exactly. all you need to know. You could literally dial for it. Exactly. And that's what we would do. We would dial for it. That's all shoot. you need to do. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Lockheed's tested. I will. Try I will it out. do that. As soon as we jump off here, I'm going to order some. <laughs> yeah, I have cases of everything in my shop. Uh, <laughs> we use patch out. We use uh, Accelerator, we use mm -hmm. IOSO, and we use Lockheed's, and we use CLR. <laughs> but, yeah, man. I mean, CLR's, CLR works great. Yeah. It works really good. Uh, uh, but we, we clean every time. Every and time. so when you do that, you, you don't really care what the solvent is that you use. You're just going to clean until you get it clean. I mean, meaning like That's if I have... Comes in. Exactly right. Okay, so like if I have bore, if I have bore tech, right? I'm just yeah, I'm matter. just gonna clean. It doesn't matter. It's just a solvent. We're we're Here, just trying here's to remove. the other thing about cleaning all the time. People have all these arguments about oh, I use this because it works better. I use that because it works better. Well, does it? Yeah, exactly. It works better we're, than what? It works better than what? So yeah, that's a good hey, part, that's a good point. When when clean is clean, right? That's the that's the finish line. So you mm -hmm. can try. Bortec and try it. And then you can try patch out or you can because try sweet. So you can try whatever. Because here's the thing about having a bore scope. You don't have, if you don't have a bore scope, you have a predefined process of how you clean your barrel. Exactly. Once you have a bore scope, that's going to change. Exactly. Because then it doesn't matter what the, pre what the process is. We're cleaning until it gets clean. Well, it, it does matter in a way that you go in and you're like, okay, so for example, I go in with CLR. That's the first thing. Three wet patches. I don't let it soak. I don't do anything. Just wet patch, clean my, clean the cleaning rod, put another patch, soak it, put it in there. Are you one just more. doing one? Are you just doing one direct pass through? Or are you scrubbing with that? No, patch? just one. One pass. Just one. And I do three wet patches. Okay, clean my rod, my cleaning rod, and. Then after that, I do alcohol just to get that CLR out of that barrel, right? Okay. Two wet patches followed by one or two dry ones just to get the alcohol out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. And then I chase it with a uh, patch out. Patch out. Again, three wet patches. And then I go in with like two wet patches of accelerator. Okay. And then... I do a uh, nylon brush, those yep. blue IOSO brushes. Yep. And when I put it in there, I actually learned this from Jason. Jason's the one who started doing it because we do it all the time, so we're experimenting. And he's like, dude, right. this really works really good. And he takes a brush and he puts a accelerator on the brush, and it acts as a lubricant. Okay. And you can literally reverse the brush. Like, you can short stroke it. Mm -hmm. And I posted that on, on social media and people were just losing their ever loving freaking minds. Cause again, it's not normal to them. Right. Yeah. I, yeah, I clean, I clean with a nylon brush and scrub back and forth. And right. Shit. Uh, so you do that and then you patch that out. Mm -hmm. Just dry and just dry patches until just they dry, come clean. The, well, the only reason, so we dry patch it. And and then we go in there with a the bore scope, and see and check and see what see where you're at with your work. What's what's in there? Oh mm -hmm. man, there's a lot of copper in there. Okay, go in there with copper remover. Oh shit, look at all this carbon. Well then, CLR, right? That's what I'm saying. At that point, you right. no longer have a predefined process because if you have carbon, you're gonna go with the carbon remover. If you have mm -hmm. copper, you're gonna go with the copper remover. And they mm -hmm. layer themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You remove, and then you're like, oh, there's a lot of carbon. You get rid of the carbon. And then you look in there and you're like, oh, look at all this copper. Okay, get rid of that. You know what I mean? Right. And then clean is clean. Yep. You know? I dig it. And, I dig it. And then when it's clean, and typically for us, after we're done with the brush and we patch it out, it's just a light hint of carbon. And then we that's where we do the, the IOS. The last bit of the, oh, the, the IOSO. Yeah, the, the 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 paste, the abrasives. 
And that one we short stroke. And we don't get totally crazy with it. But we do like one or two passes, meaning you short stroke it all the way. And then alcohol, just to get everything out of there. Dry patch it, and then go in there. I keep emphasizing dry patching, and it's not because the board needs it. It's because it's easier to see the, with the board scope. <laughs> yeah, we want to get all that stuff out of there so we yeah. can see what's going on. And typically, it's clean and nice mirror finish, happy. And that's where you want to be. Yeah. Okay. If it's not, well, again, we make a decision. Well, what needs to be done? And as the barrels get older, you'll see that it's harder and harder to clean it. Exactly. Even though you so, have the exact same amount of rounds, relatively same amount. Question on that. So have you ever noticed that it's that you can actually that you could um potentially uh over clean an old barrel over clean well i don't understand what that means by good question i that's that's been something like meaning like you can you can chunk out some of that fire that fire checking and and basically kind of ruin it for lack of better terms um that's well, you're not going to get out what's in those grooves got it it's, I mean, so, right, this goes back to clean is clean, right? Some of those, you're just not going to be able to get out, right? Mm -hmm. And and then you're just going to, again, you get to know your barrel. And you're mm -hmm. like, well, I've already cleaned and patched and I also or JB board paste or whatever abrasive that you pick. Or if you don't like abrasives, fine. Just, just scrub the shit out of it. And then you go, well, yeah, I just can't. There's this little crater in there that just has that carbon in there, but... Okay, it is what it is. It's, you can't get it. You can't go in there with a pick. Can't right? get it all out. Leave it in there. Yep, exactly. How does your rifle shoot? Shoots great. All right. Come back and clean Fantastic. it again. Don't don't waste your time trying to get that one out, right? So you'll see, like, there's, like, a, this goes back to what I said earlier. You, your barrel is not going to be the same barrel from 100, from 0 to 100, than it is from 1,500 to 1,600. And, but having mm -hmm. a bore scope, you will get to know your barrels. I have a barrel right. that has this one spot on the left side <laughs> that it, it, it's right on the land, right in the middle. It's just this crater that just gets filled in with crap, and we just can't ever get it clean. But it shoots great. It's like, okay, well, don't it worry shoots. about it. But just don't let it get right. worse. Sure. Now, this is, this is educational. Um, every time I Every time I learn these things, uh, or, or something new, right? We go out and we try it and, um, we learn more about the system and we learn more about how it all interacts with all of the components. And, you know, for, for us, it's, it's not so much along the lines of being like, so set in the way of how you do it for, for us, because we're teachers, right? We're, we're communicators. We need to be pushing these limits. We need to be pushing and figuring out, hey, okay, so Eric, okay, fine. How do you clean barrels? Fantastic. You got a lot of you got a lot of background in this. I'm gonna give that a shot and I'm gonna see how that works for me. And really the goal is to be able to communicate. The more experience we have, the better we, we are able to communicate how that experience affected the results that we have. And that's that's what the bottom line is. And I think it all, you know, we have to be open to these things. We got to be open to them or else it's going to just, it's going to close everything off and information won't flow. You as educators or even as a competitor, you have to literally be willing to destroy a few barrels in the search of what the limits are. Mm -hmm. You just have to find what that is. Uh, Lou Murtica, he, he cleans his barrel with a drill. Just... Get after it. He has a rod, and uh, my friend yeah. Jay, my friend Jay does the same thing. At Nationals, that's how we clean our barrels. He cut off the handle, and yeah. he just attaches the drill and just goes to town with a nylon I mean, brush. It's, it's metal. It's it's steel. Right, but some people, will, you know, again, yeah. When we posted that video, uh, how Jason cleans. And you can go to my YouTube channel and just look at the shorts. And I mean, Jason's just going to town and some people are like, oh, that's how you ruin your barrels. And, and, okay. oh, that's, uh, you know, that's uh, no, you know, I would never do that to my barrel. And, and, you know, my grandpa told me how, and that is, you know, and, and, you know, half of the comments are people saying we're ruining the barrel. 
And the other half are saying, you know, I did that last night with my wife and <laughs> things of that nature. <laughs> but YouTube, man, <laughs> YouTube, it's amazing. But amazing place. The point is, it's like we do this literally every day. And right. if it ruins the barrel, I'll let you guys know. Sure. But so far, it hasn't ruined it. Mm -hmm. Right. And and that's to me, that's just how. How, as as an educator myself, I think I owe it to people for me to try stuff that ruins barrels. For sure. So that when it yeah. does, I can say, hey, by the way, don't do this. If you do this, this yeah. could potentially this, happen this, to you. This will happen. Just like, a, you know, but, and you guys are kind of doing the same thing. You know, like if we were, I don't even know what, I don't know the depth of what you know uh, in your field, right? But I just know that if I was out there, if you were out there shooting PRS or doing tactical stuff, I would be leaning on you heavily to say, don't do that or do this. Right. Yep. You just have to know. Yeah, it's different. So we, we spend far less time on the nuances of the rifle and the system than we do teaching people how to shoot it. Um, and... I think at the very beginning of a shooter's journey, um, if you inundate a, a shooter, a new shooter with too much information and too many variables, they will not be able to focus on actually breaking clean shots. And that's really the goal. We have to teach somebody, okay, we have to first learn what is my rifle capable of. And once we learn what the rifle is capable of, then we can set a set, we can have realistic expectations of what can I expect? And then we teach them how to actually shoot the rifle without trying to get, trying to eliminate all these other, is my barrel clean? Is it not clean? Is it, is it doing this? Is it because of the, is it because of the temperature change or whatever? No, none of that stuff matters. We're focusing on shooting the aspect of the Phil calls it the, uh, the, the, you know, his triangle of truth, you know, like does aerodynamic jump matter? Yeah, it matters. It's a, it's a phenomenon that occurs. Does Coriolis affect the projectile? Yes, it does. But to what degree? And then we have spin drift. Okay, so those are outside the triangle. But inside the triangle, what actually gets us to connect with the target? Fundamentals of marksmanship. Do I have good data? And did I make a good wing call? If it's not one of those three things chances are you got to fix those three things and get super consistent with those three things before we can start worrying about the other effects that they do. They do affect things, but not to the point where it's going to cause you to miss a two MOA target, you know, which is a normal target size for, for tactical or PRS type competition. Um, like, you know, Philip and I going to shoot team match team matches uh, in Montana. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't give a shit about Coriolis force, man. I got a, I got a target at 1260 yards. Mm -hmm. I have to hit it in two shots. All right. right. What's my, what does the Oracle say? Okay. Oracle says I have to dial this many mills and I'm going to look at the wind and I'm going to say, okay, I think that's, I think that's like a, a 2.2 .2 mil left wind call. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Let's put a bullet in the air and see what happens. And, and really that's the nature of it because do we want to have like in the tactical world, the first round hit obviously is super important, but I think a lot of people get kind of confused with like this, what snipers are, are, are actually doing and the, the ability or the absolute need to make a first round hit out at those distances is false. It's, it's absolutely false. And then, and if you're doing some sort of select target mission where it's so important that this particular human being is eliminated from the, from the planet, I'm not going to do it with a sniper. I'm going to do it with, with a, with a munition that I can guarantee it's going to happen. Um, and obviously we're getting better and better at that by being able to have more accurate trajectory predictions for more, per, more higher percentages of first round hits. But Philip conducted a, 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 a data gathering when he was a, an instructor and 40% hit ratio first round at a grand. And that's after students had five weeks on the same range every day, 40%, right? And that's with a 308 at a thousand, at a thousand yards. Mm -hmm. It's not that great, 
right? So, and granted, we're not shooting the best, the best projectile for the, for the conditions and we're really pushing the limits of what is capable of having a first round impact simply because the efficiency of the projectile at that distance, mm -hmm. you know, one mile an hour of wind is 10 up to 10 inches, depending on the speed at which you're throwing that bullet, you know, and, and students learning how to call wind down to a mile an hour, that takes, that takes a long time to get a, a person to know how to do that and right. do it with consistency. So indeed it's, uh, it's hard. So we try to focus really first and foremost on, hey, okay, so this is your baseline. This is what you have to deal with, with your, with your components, right? which would be your rifle, your ammunition, your optic. And then we teach them, hey, we, you can get into those nuances after you learn how to be consistent and you get to a point with your marksmanship where you can start to shoot the difference and you can start to see, hey man, things are, something's kind of weird. Uh, you know, we've noticed in situations where I can't validate my trajectory all the way out to the distance that I'm going to shoot at that match. Maybe I can only do it at 650 yards. Well, we noticed that we were about a 10th, we were about a 10th low on, mo on all of our dopes. I'm not going to try to figure that out in the match. I'm just going to, we're going to look at each other and be like, Hey man, add a 10th to everything from here on out. If it's beyond 900, we're going to add a 10th and we'll figure it out later. Who gives a shit? The rifles are shooting well. We're making good wing calls. We're in the zone. We're in the groove. Who cares what? Who cares why? We'll figure that out later. When you're truing up uh, your ballistics, mm -hmm. what do you change? Do you change uh, speed or B or BC or? I don't. I don't use. I don't use BC based solutions anymore unless I absolutely have to because of the bullet that I'm shooting. I'm. I subscribe to radar drive drag curves, mm -hmm. which, which are far more accurate in terms of your ability to predict where the bullet's going to be in time and space. Mm -hmm. um, that's a. That's kind of a hot topic that I've been researching quite a bit now uh, with with Hornady. Um, those guys are putting out a tremendous amount of solid new information about hey the the like you're asking what do you do do you tune muzzle velocity or do you tune bc the fact of the matter is if you're looking if you're looking at that trajectory diagram you're always going to have error someplace somewhere unless the bullet flies the roadmap of the drag curve that's programmed into the computer program can right. you can you allow me to screen share uh yeah I want to share a screen with you real quick. All right, we're we are about to hurt some feelings. Um, so what am I uh, looking at here? So so what you're looking at here, Eric, is a, a CD versus mock graph. And so what this is, this is a depiction of your bullets drag, uh, or several bullets drag, in relationship to the standard G7 drag curve. Now everybody knows the G1, G7. Okay, so most people are that are aware and are, um, are educated. Were you if you're going to use a ballistic coefficient to um, to derive a prediction of where your bullet's going to be in time and space, um, your computer is going to utilize a G7 drag curve. And the reason that we're going to use that drag curve, if we notice here on a graph, mm -hmm. your G7 is that heavy black line, and if you notice none of the lines of the bullets match that G7 drag curve. Right. So if you look at that, that drag curve, that's the roadmap that your computer, when you have it, whether you got a Kestrel or whether you got a, a, a BC based point mass solver and you're using a G7 BC, that is what the computer thinks the bullet is going to do okay. in terms of its shape right of how much drag on the bottom of the graph is going to be your muzzle velocity and Mach number and this is where it starts over here on the right so this is let's just say it starts at Mach 2.5 okay the peak of the graph here is generally always going to be right around 1060 feet a second depending on the ambient temperature and what the uh, what the density of the air is in relationship to Mach value okay so as soon as that bullet crosses that threshold the drag drops way off because we're no longer in supersonic flight and the bullet can move through the air with much less drag. Okay. So then we see some weird stuff going on over here in the subsonic flight and we can see all kinds of crazy 
crazy, unpredictable aspects of bullet flight. That has to do with all kinds of things, bullet stability, um, you know, how is the bullet flying through the sky physically at that point in time? Because that obviously has a tremendous amount to do with how much drag it has. But where I want to focus on here is what do I do? Do I tune muzzle velocity or do I tune BC? Most people say, well, I want you to tune muzzle velocity inside 600 yards, right? We shoot at a target. Hey, I'm hitting high. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'm going to speed up my muzzle velocity because the computer is then incorrect. All that's doing to your solution is you're telling the computer where to start this graph on the, uh, the horizontal scale. So it just moves it up or down. Right. Well, actually slides it left, left or, right. or right. Okay. Yep. Okay. So the problem with that is the separation in the lines. Cause so, so let's just say, okay, so let's just look at this green line here. That's a 30 cal 190 SMK. So clearly this bullet has a higher drag coefficient than the G7 drag curve. So I'm going to have error even up close. Right. All right. So look where it intersects. It's going to intersect. Let's just call this Mach 1.5. Okay. It intersects at Mach 1.5. And if you didn't tune this and you shot at a target at Mach 1.5, your trajectory prediction would be accurate. However, if we look at the green line here and we push it a little bit deeper into that, that subsonic barrier, this is where that whole transonic, everybody thinks that weird things happen in the transonic. Mm -hmm. it, it, that's all a myth. The separation in the lines is where we have that error because so, you're so go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. It, it's no, not that weird stuff happens. It's simply that the model uh is has a larger mismatch at that point. Exactly. That's okay. exactly why. Okay. So then if we look at something even worse over here, um, let's look at this uh blue, this blue dad, the horn the 30 cal 175 match king. Mm -hmm. Not even remotely close. And the reason that this happens for the listeners out there, the reason that these lines are mismatched is just like we would compare um, the uh, Jaden uses fuel economy on vehicles, meaning like, hey, this is a Ford F-150 that gets this mileage. This is a Dodge Ram, same general shape, right? Same mm -hmm. general shape of the pickup truck, right? but one might have a little bit better aerodynamic uh, characteristic than the other which is going to lead to a different fuel economy for a given engine size and speed. That's the exact same thing that we're talking about here. So this 175 Match King, it's never going to line up. It right. could line up up close really well, but there's going to be bigger gaps and disparities. Once we try to move those lines, now if we go to BC, let's just say, okay, well, we're going to manipulate BC. Well, all we're doing with manipulating BC is removing that drag curve up and down on the scale because that's related to the drag coefficient. So the benefit of using a radar derived drag curve, it means that Hornady knows exactly how that 140 ELD match is gonna fly through the sky because they've mapped it out with a the radar. Mm -hmm. They can collect upwards of 50,000 plus data points in 4.5 seconds time of flight. Mm -hmm. That's insane. Yeah. So they know exactly what the characteristic of that drag of the bullet is. So then they create this, uh, so you see this black G7 standard line. Right. Now the computer's standard is way more accurate for your projectile. And then the only tuning that we have to do is we have to tune the different nuances of bullet stability that come with different rates of twist, different rifling profiles, different muzzle devices, those things affect drag because it affects the bullet's stability. If that makes sense. Yes. Does that make, does that clear some things up as to like, Hey, you know, no. like, have you ever been in that situation? <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> well, all right. It's not that it doesn't clear things up. It's just that, Okay, it does, but everything that I've known up to this point, which it kind of went out the window with, because it matches exactly what you just said. Like, I, that, 
precisely why I asked you the question to begin with, because mm -hmm. I never know which one to change because it mm -hmm. appears that it never matches up, which is never why I asked up. you that question. And now you're <laughs> going, well, this is why. And I'm like, oh, I mean, it clears things up. But yeah. now I have even less of an idea of what to do. <laughs> exactly. No, you want to use radar drive drag curves. So I'm going to give you an example here of why this works. Um, so I'm just opening up Litz's book right here. Okay. And Litz's book, this is this is the second edition, I think it is, uh, Ballistic Performance of Rifle Bullets. Now, the cool thing about what he provides in here is something called the form factor. Mm -hmm. Just because you have a, a BC, we still want to look at the form factor. The form factor is the comparison ratio of your bullet to the standard G7 projectile. Mm -hmm. So I just opened the book here and it first page that jumps up is the Lapua uh, 155 grain CNR, the okay. 30 cal. So if I look at the G7 form factor, of this projectile, don't even care about the BC. The G7 form factor is 0.988. So that tells me as a shooter that if I'm a if I'm an F class shooter, that doesn't really mean a whole lot to me because I don't really care about, like you said, like I can take a cider. I don't need to make sure that it's at 862 yards and I need to make that first round hit happen. It's a little different thought process. Right. But this bullet is going to fly that G7 drag curve roadmap quite accurately. Because it has that G7 form factor of 1.0, that bullet's drag is very, very close to the drag of the standard projectile, which your computer is modeling. I see. Right? So then if I go over here to this other, this next one, this is a Lapua 308, uh, 200 grain full metal jacket bow tail. That has a G7 form factor of 1.199. So <clears throat> that bullet has a tremendously amount, a tremendously more amount of drag than the standard. So therefore it's not going to fly that roadmap and you're going to have to tune the hell out of your, out of your solution to get everything to line up. If you're using a ballistic computer program, if you're using hard dope and you're just shooting yard lines, it's of no consequence, but you have to stay with that hard dope or your ballistic computer program is most likely not going to line up very well. Right. Okay. I just realized I opened a big can of worms. You opened a can of worms. We just don't have enough time for. <laughs> You're we're, right, man. We're going to have right. to come back. And I, I, this is the type of thing. This is why I, oh, I, I love doing these interviews because these chats, not even an interview, I, I, just chats, because I just learned something that's been precisely why I asked the question. I don't even know what to do. And you're like, well, you'll mm -hmm. never get it. Yep. So this He'll is this it. is absolutely something I'm gonna learn about, and I think it's gonna help a lot of people. So we're just gonna have to do this again. We'll hit, we'll hit the pause button. To, we'll come back. We're gonna have to spend more time on on this topic alone. In the mm -hmm. meantime, it's gonna give me some time to do a little research on it because sure. I have no idea. This is a literally the first time I've heard of it. Okay, this is mm -hmm. how much I don't know about it. So. Um, I think it's best that we do that. <laughs> I agree, man. Is, I think it's, uh, I'm, I'm excited. This, this is where this is like, so I learned a tremendous amount from you in terms of like physical rifle properties. That's your world. That's mm -hmm. you spend way more time getting into tune with that because that's where you make your, that's your bread and butter. That's what's going to keep you in, in the X ring and not throwing shots out of the X and into the 10 and definitely not throwing shots out of the 10 into the nine. Right. Whereas for us, it's a different game. We're less concerned about the physical properties of the rifle and more concerned about how we interact with it and how we shoot it. And on the external ballistics portion of it, how, clo how close, because if I have a two minute of angle target or a minute and a half angle target at 860 something yards, I got to hit that thing. Right. Right. And so my prediction and my trajectory has to be accurate. And this is where I spend the majority of my time is learning how this all works. Um, in the meantime, before we jump off here, go check out Hornady's podcast. They have been producing fantastic content and he had Jaden and uh, Seth Swarzik sit down. I would encourage you to watch the YouTube video. Mm -hmm. um, maybe just put it up on the TV in the shop 
And because um, he uses a lot of those graphic aids, like I pulled up, I just, I got that graphic from Jaden. I said, Hey man, can you do this comparison for me and these projectiles? He said, yeah, no problem. So um, that, that podcast is very, very educational. And if I, I guarantee if you let, if you watch those two episodes, internal ballistics, or I'm sorry, external ballistics, episode one and two, mm -hmm. when we do come back to this, Eric, you and I are going to be able to have a really, really cool conversation that a lot of people are going to benefit from. I will do that. And I will link those on the description below. If you're watching this podcast, go to my description. I will link those there. So you guys can also do that because we're going to follow this up. This is. Yeah, man. Very interesting. Caitlin, man, I appreciate this. And, uh, oh, I'm excited. I, I just love yeah, I learning about too. this stuff. <laughs> Me too, man. Me too. I learned a lot today. Thank you for your time, Eric. And thank you for the invitation. I'm looking forward to future chats. And, um, yeah, man, it's been so a good where, time. So where can people find you if they want uh, to you guys can. Yeah, uh, you guys can find us at um, moderndaysniper.com on the internet. Um, you guys can find us also at the Modern Day Rifleman Network, where we have um, a really, really rapidly growing group of shooters. Uh, it's a kind of our own social network. It's not Facebook. It's not Instagram. Uh, it's troll free. For those of you guys there, I mean, I care about that. I don't like dealing with trolls. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously we got Instagram and uh, and Facebook stuff going on. But uh, we'd love to see you guys in the network if that's uh, if that's what you're looking for. For sure. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to nominate anyone because you're coming back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it sounds good. I'll have it in my mind of who to nominate next. All right, man. Good deal. I appreciate it. Yeah, Take man. Care. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.